Transmitter device activating. Coordinates set for Earth 2. Saddle up partners and welcome back to the Earth 2 podcast, your weekly podcast that explores the origins and development of the DC Comics multiverse and the legacy of their Golden Age characters through the Silver and the Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter Watson. Yeehaw! And I'm David Steele. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us. It's not our first rodeo, or is it? No, it ain't our first rodeo. <laughs> I saw a tweet on my time hop that I retweeted from a couple of years ago the other week. And the person was saying, on my way to my first rodeo, I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> Superb. Yes. Listeners, welcome back. Indeed, yes, we are, you may have guessed from all this, this torturous banter that we are back in the pages of Adventure Comics and we're back with the Vigilante, the, the Prairie Troubadour and revived Golden Age Adventurer. Mm-hmm. Um, Adventure Comics 422, published on the 29th of June, 1972. A mere 11 days after Paul McCartney's 30th birthday. Ooh. And a mere eight days before Ringo Starr's 32nd birthday. There we are. So there we are. Mm. Don't, don't say I'm, I'm only favouring McCartney. I think Peter should tell you about the cover to issue 422 of Adventure Comics. I would be delighted to tell you about this cover. It is, it's basically an homage to King Kong. Yeah, fantastic. We have a view down above a city. We are at the top of a skyscraper. There is a giant green robot climbing it. Mm. In his hand is the limp form of <gasps> Supergirl Gasp. Yeah. And he's being attacked yes. by some fighter planes. Crikey jings. And it says Adventure Comics starring Supergirl. Amazing. And there's no hint of what else is in this comic. No. Like we said already when we did the Black Canary and the other Vigilante story, and I suppose even the Zatanna stories, it's quite a mixed bag mm-hmm. at this point, Adventure Comics, and the next couple of Vigilante stories that we're going to do from, from later issues, this, the comic's even more of a mixed bag by that point. It has a, a bit of an identity crisis in its 420s, yes. I think. And we'll talk about some of that a little further on. Yes, have mm-hmm. we had a King Kong homage before? I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't believe so. No. Perhaps you could do a King Kong homage cover gallery for the socials. <laughs> Can I be bothered? No, probably can't. I mean, what have I got lined up for this? I've got a few foreign reprints of this cover. I'll probably stick them up, just so folks can see them and, and do what they like with them after that. Yes, it's always fun when we talk about the cover when we're not actually doing the story that it relates to. <laughs> Makes me laugh anyway. It's become a tradition, really, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, it has. So yes, now that the cover's out of the way, let's go to the, the story inside. We have an opening caption, which reads... The Vigilante, Vigilante in, in Rodeo, Rodeo of, of Death. Death. See, that's why we were talking about rodeos earlier. And an introductory text caption reads, Thrashing hooves, hoots and hollers, thundering applause. The rodeo is in town. The vigilante watches with envy. How long since he's broken a bronc? New York is a long way from the range. Times have changed and... So have rodeos. Yes, this opening image is startling. It's the view through a pair of binoculars of a cowboy falling off a horse. We should point out the cowboy is a black man. His cowboy hat falling off. He has the number nine, it looks like, attached to the back of his shirt. Mm -hmm. And we also see an inset of the chap who's looking through the binoculars. And it's none other than the vigilante himself, who is thinking, "Uh uh-oh, there goes his horse. And it looks, actually, as if, yeah, the horse has tipped over. A tiny caption tells us that... Story, Bill Meredith, Art, Grey Morrow. Fantastic, Grey Morrow returns. Panel two of this opening page, it's another binocular view, and we see a shady-looking guy with a hat and big glasses and a moustache and overcoat and a very fancy-looking gun, it must be said. It looks like it's got a silencer at the end of it. And Vigilante's obviously clocked this guy through his binoculars, and he's thinking, and there's the reason, a sniper. The next panel, it's a wider shot of Vigilante, a great shot of his scarf and his top and his white hat, and he's got some rope out, and he's got a lasso thing going on, and he's thinking, why he'd shoot that horse is something I aim to find out. And the next panel, gosh, it looks like he's looped his rope around something, and he's swinging down towards where the sniper is. It looks like the sniper's actually standing at the edge of the arena, because we see him from behind as Vigilante swings down on his rope, and the sniper is thinking... Looks like I got a hero on my hands. Okay, hero, let's put you in for a purple heart. The final panel of page one is a cracking shot of Vigilante swinging along on his rope, but seen through the sights of the sniper. That's cracking. This whole page is fantastic. Mm. Green Morrow doing what he does best. First panel of page two. And it does look as though his entire face is made up of things you buy from a joke shop. 
He's <laughs> loosely his tash. But anyway, there's a couple of snick snicks as he fires. The caption for panel two of page two. The first bullet finds its target. Yeah, and we see that Vigilante has put his hand up to his head and he's let go of his rope. As he falls, caption of panel three says, But it's the second sting of steel that really hits the bullseye. Yes, some punning going on there because we can see the second sniper's bullet has struck one of the bulls that's being held in a sort of... Is that a corral? Is that what you'd say? Corral, pen, yep. Yeah, been a, penned up with a few others and that's obviously set him a bit wild because he's rearing up and breaking out of the fencing. The caption for panel four of page two. Vigilante could feel the bloody trickle of his wound. His vision was hazy. His legs were like butter. Only his ears responded. There was no mistaking the thunder he heard. Stampede! It's a very dynamic shot, this. Vigilante down on the ground thinking, Can't move! It's all around him. Panic is going on. We can see some of their cowboys trying to get stuff out of the way from the marauding bulls. We see one other cowboy on a horse right in from the side of the frame. The caption for the next panel says, A hand reached toward him, shouts clattering into the numbness of his brain. Vigilante has made it up to his feet as the bulls get closer, and the side of the panel, we see a hand reaching down from horseback and saying, Quick, partner, grab my hand. Those Brahmas are meaning to bury us. And the final panel of page two, we see that it's the same cowboy who was shot in the first panel of page one that's managed to reach down and grab Vigilante and lift him up onto the back of his horse. Fantastic. First caption on page three then says, Moments later. Yep, and it's a view almost from Vigilante's point of view, actually, as he looks up. Two black men are leaning down in front of his view. One is the guy that we saw earlier on. One is an older man. You can see that his hair and his beard and eyebrows have gone to white. We get a closer look at the chap who's on the horseback. He's got a nice thick moustache and a cracking pair of 70s sideburns. Yay. Fantastic. The man who'd been on horseback says, Nope, you're not in heaven, partner, but you came pretty close. The older guy says, I'm Pappy Sims. This here's my boy, Phoenix. Pull out wider shot. We can see that Vigilante is now sitting up the side of a bed, rubbing his head. The older gentleman, we can see he's wearing a white jacket, purple trousers, he's a red shirt, nice boot lace tie, big green cowboy hat. Continues. It's our rodeo. How you feeling, son? Vigilante says, like somebody branded me. What's this all about? And the younger black man says, Relax, friend. Come on in and meet the boys. Two more black men into the room. Again, we're aware this is, might be racially sensitive. We're trying to be as tactful as possible, but it's making a point, as you'll see, obviously, through the story. Two other guys enter. Pappy Sims says, Polecat, Ramrod, say hello to... But he's cut off as Vigilante says, Vigilante will do. Howdy. In the next panel, he looks around the room and he can see that there's some, what looks like, tape recording equipment going on. Some other fancy bits and bobs. Vigilante says, I thought all cowboys travelled light. Pappy Sims says, Not these saddle shiners, bub. They got up stereo with their sagebrush. And then Phoenix says, We even got a transponder system to keep track of the vehicles and the critters if they get lost. Transponder? That's fancy equipment. See Pappy's, <laughs> see Pappy Sims, a nice fancy old pipe in his mouth here, actually. So he points to the equipment and says, Simple enough. You clip it on to whatever you want to follow, and a computer relays the position. Vigilante sat down again in the first panel of page four, as Pappy Sims continues. You've got quite a rep as a do-good of Vigilante. Don't suppose you'll be interested in the troubles of... Again, Vigilante interrupts, saying, When I get shot at, I get interested. Pappy Sims continues in panel two. Three days ago, I get a call from the chairman of the Committee for Racial and Social Harmony. Crash, for short. I figure it's a charity pitch until this snake tells me to. And this next panel has a flashback ripple. And we see a hooded figure. It's, you know, how do we want to describe this hood, Peter? It's just a purple hood. A purple clan-like hood. That's fine. Yeah, that's what I was sort of thinking. Yeah, we can see this guy with his clan-like hood. has the phone up to his face. He's wearing white gloves, obviously. And he's saying, Get your rodeo out of town, Mr. Sims. The next panel, we see a wider shot of this chap in the hood. He stood at the top of a table. It's about nine or ten men all sat around it. It's a couple of guard-type figures standing around. And hooded figure continues to say on the phone, our committee took a vote and decided there were no such thing as black cowboys. We don't want to mislead all those kids who come to see you, do we, Mr. Sims? Guess you've made a mistake. I make myself clear, Mr. Sims? Flashback ends. We're back in the present. 
Panel 5 of page 4, you can see that Vigilante is now standing outside a large, well, God, crikey. It looks like a Generation 1 futuristic transformer, to be honest. It's, <laughs> we can see, though, that it's labelled Vista Dome Mobile Home Pappy Sims Rodeo. So that's possibly what they were just inside for all the equipment. Mm. You can see a little set of steps leading into it. Vigilante is now standing outside alongside Phoenix and Polecat and Ramrod. So Polecat is saying... Two of our prized Brahmas were poisoned day before yesterday. Ramrod says, Then tonight, that sniper shoots Phoenix's horse. Phoenix says, The whole point of this tour is to publicise just how big a part black cowboys had in taming the West. Final panel of page four, Vigilante and Phoenix are standing to the side of all this. We can see some city lights in the background, very effective. Vigilante and Phoenix are shaking hands. Vigilante says, Oh, you big one, Phoenix. I'll do what I can to help. Thanks, Vig. Come on over to the show tomorrow and keep an eye on things. But don't worry about it tonight. Get a good night's sleep. Picking up on what Phoenix said in the last panel of the previous page, Vigilante's thinking, OK, partner, I just might do that. And the caption says, But all the way back to his hotel, the Vigilante does worry, realising Crash is more than just a group of citizens misled by their prejudice. These are professional killers who won't stop at shooting just horses. Panel two, it's a sort of Dutch tilted shot of an office building, skyscraper type, nice moody sky. Gray Morrow's very good at this, he really is. Mm. I mean, look at the the bare bones in the tree in panel one there, it's very, very nice. Yes. Anyway, and a voice is coming from inside the skyscraper. We're through taking pot shots at animals. I want Phoenix Sims brought here. Panel three, we see that the, it's the hooded figure, the chairman, who's speaking again to his boardroom. We'll let him decide. Either he gets his phony cowboys, or... He will stay here for good, in pieces. Understand? One of his lackeys off camera can be heard saying, We understand, Mr. Chairman. Tiny caption says, continued in second page following, we've passed an advertisement that talks about the end of the skinny body. I'll leave that mm -hmm. to your imagination. The first panel of page six. And it's a montage shot showing Phoenix doing some horse trickery. Close up as well, being applauded. There's a couple of craggy faced White guys in suits watching him from the from the crowd. Caption runs along the bottom of this panel saying, There are no doubts in the minds of the crowd that this man they are watching is a cowboy. A cowboy whose courage and stamina holds them all spellbound. A cowboy and a man who, for no other difference than his colour, other men want to destroy. Panel two, you can see Phoenix and he looks resplendent in his gear actually. Look at those chaps. He's walking off the saddle over his shoulder. And the two craggy-faced hoods that were watching him in the inset panel on panel one are standing round a corner as he approaches. The first one of them says, Here he comes. Remember, the chairman wants him alive. Panel three, they strike. The first lad says, Now. Okay, cowboy, let's see how you like our hospitality. And with a whap, he strikes Phoenix from behind. Phoenix goes down. Panel four, we see a large green car speeding off. And it's been spotted by Vigilante, who's on his motorbike and is thinking, Just as I figured, sooner or later they had to make their move. Hope Pappy gets that nor I left him. The final panel of page six is a close shot of Vigilante speeding along on his bike and there's a weird sort of pink, reddish tint to the air around him. At first I thought it was just because he was speeding past all the, the exciting neon lights of whatever city they're in at the moment. But as well as his own gear, he's wearing a thick pair of what looked like fancy swimming goggles. And he's thinking, they can't see this infrared beam. But with these special goggles, I can follow without endangering Phoenix. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Has he put something on the car to track it or something? Looks like it. I don't know. A mm, bit vague. First panel of page seven. It's an aerial shot of the boardroom table that we saw earlier on. The two goons that we met a second ago have brought in Phoenix's body. The first guy is saying... Here's your pigeon, Mr. Chairman. This is one bag he didn't like being in. Ha <laughs> ha, says the other guy, <laughs> for no apparent reason. Panel 2, page 7. Vigilante has opened up a small hatchway. It looks like the bottom of a lift shaft, quite frankly. We can see the cables behind him. He's doing some work with a fancy pair of pliers, and he's thinking, they've got Phoenix in the penthouse. First, I'll release the automatic lock control and the doors up there. Panel 3, we're back in the penthouse boardroom. Phoenix has his back to us. He's sat in a chair. In the close foreground, we can see a hand holding a pistol at him, and the hooded chairman figure is saying, Your show is making a mockery of the West. It's bad for the harmony of the system, Mr. Sims. To which Phoenix replies, Harmony? 
Isn't that where you people write the music and my people sing the song? Panel four, we can see Vigilante's now climbing up the cables of the lift shaft. That's a great panel. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Awesome. And he's thinking, somebody might notice the elevator coming up, so I'll take this cable instead. Wouldn't want to spoil the surprise. The final panel of page seven has a suited chap standing outside the elevator door, obviously. And he's heard something from inside because he says, Hey, somebody knocking from inside the elevator? Who the... And in the first panel of page eight... Vigilante bursts into the room, kicking the door open, sending one guy who was standing behind the door flying and kicking the guy that we just heard speaking, square in the stomach. As he enters the room, Vigilante says, Thought you'd never answer. Got room for one more? Phoenix cries, Vigilante! The chairman says, Another cowboy! Get him, you fools! Kill him! It's all kicking off in panel two. Vigilante pulls his pistol and shoots at one of the goons as he says, Time to round up these strays, Phoenix! Sure beats punching cows, says Phoenix as he punches out one of the bad guys. Slight change of angle for panel three. Vigilante says, Seems you're a little colour blind, Mr Chairman. Or haven't you noticed cowboys come in all colours? At this point, oh no. We can see that the chairman has pulled a gun in the background. He fires on Vigilante. Phoenix ducks into the way saying, Vig, watch it. Oh no. Panel four, we see that Phoenix is down on the ground. Vigilante has been held from behind by a couple of the chairman's goons. The chairman says, You fool! We're trying to save the American image. Phonies like Sims are ruining our country. And I suppose you think you're real people, says Vigilante. He continues the next panel. We can see he's got a gun to his head, but he doesn't stop him from saying, If Phoenix Sims is a phony, then people like you are traitors. You should have concentrated more on the fighting than the speech-making, cowboy. We pull back. For a wider shot in the first panel of page nine, we see Phoenix stretched out on the ground. Vigilante standing with his hands up, chain with a gun pointed at him. One of the sooted goons has examined Phoenix's body and says, This one's dead, Mr. Chairman. And an older, thicker set, bald and bespectacled gentleman standing behind him says, But you said there'd be no killing. What do we do now? To which the chairman says, It's obvious, isn't it? We're safe as long as there's no witnesses. Panel two is a close up shot. Of the chairman. We can see over his head though. Peering through the window. Of the elevator door. Are a couple of familiar faces. The chairman says. Sims should have listened to reason. Blame him but. That's how it goes partner. And then the door bursts open. Pappy Sims and Ramrod. Explode into the room. Pappy Sims says in reply to the chairman. Maybe not you dirty rattler. Get him boys. Vigilante has been set free. He starts to lasso. Ramrod says. Need idea hooking that transponder unit up to yourself, vigilante. And Polka, who's there as well, says, Falling you was easier than a wrangler tracking strays. In the foreground of the panel, the chairman is making a run for it. Vig is whirling his rope behind. And in the first panel of page 10, we see that the chairman is making for the window. But vigilante's managed to lasso him by the leg. And as he does this, he says, We got a showdown coming, mister. And the chairman goes right through the window. See the blind flying up the glass, splintering and shattering everywhere. He's falling forwards with his right leg, lassoed by Greg. The caption says, For one brief instant, Vigilante's lariat goes taut, then slack, and a long stream reverberates through the steel and concrete canyons. Yeah, almost a narrative leap here, because Vigilante then says, The broken glass would cut the rope. Yeah, the chairman has fallen to his death. (sighs) Interesting. Caption for panel four. There are no words, no whispers. Pappy's tears say it all. Yeah, shot of Pappy Sims cradling his dead son. That's terrible. Caption for panel five. The anger caged within begs for release, but the violence here is done. Yeah, we see the the board members, let's call them that, all standing lined up. And Polecat and Ramrod have obviously got guns pointed at them. Um, Vigilante's in the foreground. He's looped his rope around his shoulder. His head bowed. He makes his exit. The caption for the final panel says, So he points his roaring mechanical steed toward some unknown destination, letting the knight tear at his face and scream in his ears. But there is no solace in the wind. Yeah, this final panel shows Vigilante scooting out of town on his bike. And a small caption tells us, End. And another caption says, Next issue, on sale, on or about July 27th. (laughs) But I don't think we'll be doing Adventure Comics 423. But anyway, so there we are. Gosh, well, 
that was all very intense and exciting. Yeah, I, to be honest, when I first read this story, I didn't enjoy it very much, but I got a lot more from rereading it. Mm. I felt a bit heavy handed at first, but I actually really enjoyed the storytelling in it. And again, Gray Mora's artwork is phenomenal. With great respect to him for there for that, because there's so many good panels in this. Again, it's going to be hard to uh, pick some some of the best ones to, to put up in the socials. It's a bit of a tragedy, really, isn't it? It's, it certainly is. I feel very... I mean, Phoenix, obviously, you know, it's twice he saved Vigilante's life. He pulls him out of the way of the bulls and then, you know, ducks in his road mm-hmm. to stop him getting shot. And it's not the ending that I saw happening. I thought no. when I was reading it that either Phoenix would have found a new name and become Greg's sidekick or something... <laughs> Or, you know, would have patted him on the shoulder and waved him off and said, thanks for helping stopping the bad guys. It's, yeah. I mean, it's ultimately, it's a, you can't say it's a happy ending. It's not because, you know, what should have happened really was that the chairman should have been unmasked and revealed as to who he is. There might have been some significance, maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the fact that he just sort of dies off camera is a little bit, a little bit unsatisfying, I thought. Yeah. It's one of these things because they've only got ten pages to play with. Mm-hmm. It's excellent, but I just feel that you know a few more pages they could have fleshed a couple of things out, maybe and made it yeah. a little bit more, I don't know, satisfying. Yeah, definitely. I must admit, I wasn't familiar with the writer of the story, Bill Meredith, and I've, I just looked him up before we started. And this is one of very few stories I actually did. There's only this and a couple of uh, mystery stories. Okay. For some of the horror books that. I can see listed on Mike's anyway that he might have other credits right. elsewhere. But yeah, it's not anyone I was particularly familiar with. It, certainly it feels very much like a like a tryout story kind of thing, you know, just to see what these new writers are like and then, you know, if if, yeah. if they take off, then, you know, they can give them one of the bigger books. But mm-hmm. yeah, nothing really seemed to happen with Bill Meredith and I don't know anything about him at all, to be honest. No, it's it's not anything that I recognise. Mm. I mean, it's, let's be honest, it's an interesting story. It's making mm. a point about Racial integration in America, which as we've talked before when we did our John Stewart episode, yeah. and I'm sure we'll talk about it again. It's still a still an ongoing issue. Fifty years after this comic was published, yeah. you know, in some ways things aren't any better. You know, yeah. as we said in the past, for you know, as a tryout story, it's it's quite a brave thing to sort of talk mm-hmm. about. And but there's so many undeveloped ideas in it. I mean, and I don't make that sound like a, a criticism. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's all the stuff about the, the transporter and the electronic equipment that's set up at the start. That's quite interesting the way that's resolved. Yeah. Uh huh. That's very Chekhov's gun. When it was introduced, it's like, yes, this yeah. we have got this equipment, yeah, so you know it's going to be used by the end of the story. <laughs> Hexachromite gas, it's um it's lethal to <laughs> reptile and marine life. Yes. And as I say, this this point about the the, the history of, of black men in the set and the, the settling and, and sort of forging of America, mm-hmm. it's it's an interesting story to have squirreled away at the background of a supergirl story that produces Yeah. In a King Kong homage with a giant green robot, it's it's what I said about adventure comics being really uneven and quite messy, and it's sh- yeah. you know it's smorgasbord buffet approach to uh-huh. to comics. It's in, I mean the rodeo thing's actually interesting. We should probably talk. And this is running at the time of you know Glenn Campbell's you know hits you know Rhinestone Cowboy and yeah uh-huh, would be Country Boy and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean Urban Cowboys are quite a big thing in the seventies. I mean, we're probably a little too early for the the real sort of you know Dolly Parton, Burt Reynolds esque sort of peak. You know, we're probably still <laughs> yes, a few years early yes, for that. But uh, it's, I mean, mean, one thing that was sort of, I was reminded of was I think every American adventure series of the seventies probably did at least one rodeo episode. I'm yep. sure there was an episode of Knight Rider. Yeah, there's at least one episode of the Incredible Hulk. You know, yeah. which involves this sort of stuff. It's it's quite a sort of seventies American storytelling trope. Definitely. Definitely. And it'll be interesting to see if any more rodeos pop up in any more of the stories that we're going to be doing. <laughs> Unlikely, but we should keep an eye out for that because we never know. Yeah. Take a drink if there's a rodeo involved in the story. <laughs> yes, take a if there's a rodeo and some dustbins and a mm. full moon, then you'll be paralytic. Yes. It's an interesting story. I mean, it's Grey Morrow's art is phenomenal. There's, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's given quite as many opportunities to be as spectacular as he was in the Zatanna story or indeed the last Vigilante story. No, that's very true, very true. Even just that opening montage with the sniper is all very good and the, the rescue from the bulls and then you know, yeah. climbing up the lift shaft. and It's just a shame it's not longer. Two or three more pages. and Yeah. Imagine this had been like a, a three-parter like the, the Zatanna story. That would have been great. I know. Yeah. That would have been. I feel so sorry for Phoenix. Yeah. Phoenix, who doesn't rise from his own ashes, that's, you know, that's... Uh, no, yes. <laughs> Sadly. I know. Sadly. Yeah, it's, I mean, that shot of, of his dad and him, that's... that's that's Yeah, it's horrible. Aye. Yeah. 
a lot of pathos, a lot of tragic, tragic irony. Mm-hmm. It's a weird one. It's a weird one. The sniper that you mentioned looks looks like he's got the Groucho specs on, and some panels actually looks a bit like Stan Lee cosplaying Inspector Clouseau. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Which is very strange. The panel where he's got Vigilante in his sights just before he takes the shot, uh, suspiciously the cross crosshairs are in his groin. So <laughs> <laughs> we don't really see where Vig is shot properly and we don't see how he, how he recovers. I think there's a slight <laughs> sense that the way that Vigilante's sort of clutching his head that maybe he was he was just sort of, his skull was scraped yeah. or something. But no, I know what you mean. I would <laughs> hope that, that Vigilante was just swinging through the sights at that point and yes. that was just the sniper <laughs> taking aim rather than going for that particular point of his anatomy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the imagery of the villain, obviously, we, we should touch on that. There's not mm-hmm. really a subtext going on there, is no. there? You know, no, he's it's... got a clan-style hood and all that. He's, mm-hmm. He reminds me very much of, of Tarantula from the, the very first Sandman story. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Maybe not the very first, but you know, one of the very first Sandman stories obviously mm-hmm. popped up in, in Sandman Mr. Theatre as well. Yeah. It's such a loaded sort of image in, in sort mm-hmm. of American storytelling from our perspective, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. But it is one that has become more common recently in storytelling, I think primarily because of you know, the, the current tensions, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, sadly. And also, whenever I see that image as well, I'm always reminded of, and this is taking away from the, the power of it a bit, I'm always reminded of the opening credits for the Batman TV show. Of course. When you've got all the cartoon characters all coming towards them, you've got sure. Joker, Penguin, Catwoman, Man with a Bag in His Head. Yes. It's literally as they all approach it. It's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I always made that joke every time I watch the show. <laughs> <laughs> that famous famous Batman villain, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a weird one. It's a little unsatisfying because mm. of its brevity, but it does pack a little punch. I think there's some there's some obvious stuff that it's saying. Yeah, and it's told fairly well. Mm-hmm. I like the fact that it seems the last story we did with Vigilante. You know, each episode finishes with him Bill Bixby style, just yeah. getting out of town. Yep, that's it. That's <laughs> you it. know, keep going. Yep. But these bad guys crash. What was it? The Committee for Racial and Social Harmony, which yeah. sounds all too real, really, doesn't it? They it does. they're ripe for being used, like again mm-hmm. in DC. And but as far as I'm aware, this is their only appearance. And as I said, uh, this is one of very few stories that Bill did. So maybe he did have ideas to do more. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's one of the better stories from this time that have actually tackled racial issues. To be honest, yes, because some of them are a wee bit heavy handed. Yes, but this is more. It feels more kind of realistic because, you know, this sort of family unit that are uh, self-employed and they've got this business and they're traveling and they're putting across this idea and it's realistic's the wrong word, but it seems more appropriate. I know what you mean. They're, they don't come across as, as caricatured, yeah. overly stylized. Mm-hmm. You know, when we did the first John Stewart story, obviously we talked about the slight caricature elements of, of Luke Cage and that whole black exploitation sort yeah, of thing. And that's sure. not what's being done here. They're being presented as people, which is mm-hmm. which is great. I feel so sorry for Pappy Sims though, man. That's that shot of him crying is just horrendous. Mm-hmm. And you just gotta hope that the crash get taken down and dealt with, you know, that there's enough local interest. The opening caption says New York is a long way from the range. We presume that this is where the story's set. We just got to hope that yeah. the local law enforcement people deal with it all. And it's um yeah, it's a sad one. Not the chirpiest and cheeriest of stories we've done, it must be said. No, definitely not. Let's hope the next time that Vigilante turns up there won't be <laughs> quite quite such a bummer of an ending. Yeah, and there will be more Vigilante stories coming up, not just in Adventure Comics, but in other places as well, and we will be covering all of these stories yes. too. It's 1972, it's the year of the Vigilante. Mm-hmm. Very much so, as my old biology teacher used to say. <laughs> Sadly, there's no reader reaction for this story, because as David said earlier on, Adventure Comics does do a little bit of a shake-up shortly after this, mm-hmm. and in doing so, they kind of like miss the letters pages for this story. Yeah. Which is very frustrating. I was going through the letters pages and checking last night, listeners, and they miss out this issue, they miss out another one, because one letters page is getting over to Joe Orlando talking about the new direction they're taking the series in, and yeah, mm-hmm. and and then all sorts of stuff, and so this one's this one falls through the, the net, unfortunately, but mm-hmm. of course, as Peter would no doubt say, that doesn't stop you from getting in touch and telling us what you think of the story. Absolutely, yes, I would say that, but you've already <laughs> said it for me. If you want to, you can email us at theearth2podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you follow us on social media because we're putting up some lovely bonus material for this and indeed every episode on Facebook and Instagram we're at the Earth 2 Podcast and on Twitter we're at podcast underscore Earth 2. If you're feeling generous, you could go to wherever it is you receive your podcast and give us a 
a nice review. We had a nice review the other day, actually, which made us both feel um, uh, quite sort of straight-backed and chest out and quite pleased. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. We got a sort of notification that that had come through, so that was fun. Thank you to Bryaniac for that review. Yes, that was amazing. But yes, please check out the, the socials, as always, because we'll be putting up some panels in the story. As I say, I found some foreign covers. And there have been a few other bits and bobs of vigilante-related bonus content going up recently. And there will be a few more because, as Peter said earlier on, he's going to reappear in Adventure Comics, but also in a couple of other series very, very soon. So if you like Vigilante, stick with us. Also, if you like Vigilante, you should check out the excellent Prairie Justice podcast by Ranger Gord. Mm. He's covering all of his stories as well, but from the Golden Age. So check them out. He does like full-on radio dramatizations of them. And they are fantastic. He's a very brave man. Yes. <laughs> His commitment is astonishing. Yes. And he's a really good guy, and you should go and check it out, because, you know, we are doing Vigilante's sort of Bronze Age stuff here, but as Peter says, you know, Ranger Gord's doing the proper stuff, and he covers, as well as the stories from Action Comics, he's covering the Seven Soldiers of Victory stuff as well, and it's and it's fantastic, so you should go and check that out. Mm -hmm. Once again, we'll also give a, a signal boost to Opal City Confidential by our pal Ross from Stop Let's Team Up because as we record this, I've just recorded another episode with Ross, so Pete and I will be popping up on that occasionally. So if you don't get enough of us on here, you can check us out over there as well. But you should also listen to Ross's other episodes because Ross is a great guy and he loves his comics and that comes across so well. There we are. On that note, I've been Peter. I've been David. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon on The Earth 2, Two Podcast. Podcast. Yeehaw! Transmatter cube activated. Return coordinates set for Earth Prime. Another cowboy. Get him, you fools. Kill him. Uh, do you want to try that again? Make it just a little bit more manic, sort of heightened. It's hard to be manic and southern at the same time. <laughs> I, I, know, I, know, I know, I know, but you okay. can do it. Another cowboy. Get him, you fools. Kill him. Yes. Okay, yes. Cool. Oh, superb. I can't wait to hear this now. <laughs>